Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Going back to some of the events in the aftermath of uh, Khaybar, one of the leaders of the Jewish tribes taking uh, refuge in Khaybar was Kinana ibn Abi Huqayq. Kinana ibn Abi Huqayq comes from a family that has a long history of enmity against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His brother Salam or Salam was one of the leaders of Bani Nadir who were exiled to uh, Khaybar when, the, uh, when they betrayed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they were exiled to that land what the events of Surah Al-Hashr is talking about that uh, so his brother Kinana ibn Abi Al-Huqayq had married the daughter of another leader and that leader was Huyay ibn Akhtab, another leader of uh, Bani uh, Al-Nadir. And later on, Huyay ibn Akhtab, you probably have heard his name. He was the leader who led the tribes of the Jews, especially the remainders of Bani Al-Nadir and Bani Quraida, to betray the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Battle of Al-Ahzab. And he was killed for that betrayal because it was high treason in the time of war. But his daughter was married to uh, Kinana ibn Abi Al-Huqayq. One day she saw she was recently married to him a few days. She was just a few days a new bride and she saw in her dream as if a moon came from Yathrib from al Madinah Munawwara and fell in her lap. So that was coinciding with the arrival of the army of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that started the siege around Khaybar. She told her husband about that dream. So as soon as he heard it, he slapped her on the face very forcefully. He gave her, he gave her a black eye and he told her, now you're wishing that you would become the wife of that king of Medina, talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And later on, after the, the end of uh, the, the siege of Khaybar, Kinana was one of the leaders who negotiated with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he had the tribal treasure, the treasure of the tribe that consisted of a lot of gold and a lot of jewelry and things like that. And he hid it. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him, where is the treasure of your tribe? And he said, oh, you know, we have spent it because we have been living here in exile and that was our source of income. So we kept spending it over the years. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, well, Al-Ahzab was not that long ago. It was only less than two years ago. And you had a lot of wealth. You couldn't have spent all of that. But he told him, no, 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 we have spent it. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, tell me the truth. And he told him, I am telling you the truth. So the Prophet ﷺ told him, okay, if we find that you are lying, you're going to be killed for that because that would be treason. And the man said, I accept that term. So... It came to the knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ that he had hid his money and this wealth in a certain place between two palm trees. So the Prophet ﷺ informed his companions, go and search between these two palm trees. And they excavated there and they found that uh, treasure and the man was killed for his treason. Now his wife was uh, a captive of war, a prisoner of war. The Prophet ﷺ told her, if you want, you can embrace Islam and you're going to be free. Or if you want, I can send you back to your people and you're going to live with them, with the remainder of the people of Khaybar whom, who have been approved for staying there. And she told the Prophet Wasallam, I do not want to stay with my people. I choose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told her, but remember your father, was the man who conspired against me, who tried to unite the, the Arabs and the Jews against me. And she responded to the Prophet Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, don't you have in the Quran, وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى that a soul should not be held responsible for what another soul has acquired. So what if my father was a bad person? I should not be held accountable for that. The Prophet Wasallam liked her logic, liked her eloquence. And the Prophet Wasallam proposed to her, if you want, I'm going to set you free and you can become my wife 
And she told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's exactly what I want. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam married a Sayyida Safiya radiallahu anha, Sayyida Safiya bint Huyay ibn Akhtab radiallahu anha, who became another wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ummul Mu'mineen radiallahu anha. A Sayyida Safiya radiallahu anha was relatively young in age. She was probably in her late teens or something like that. And uh, when the Prophet Sallallahu noticed the black eye that she had from the slap or her, of her former husband, he asked her about that and she told him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about what she had seen in her dream and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was pleased with what she had told him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, inside the household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was this jealousy among the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, especially Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha and Sayyida Hafsa radiallahu anha. Sayyida Aisha bint Abi Bakr radiallahu anhuma and Sayyida Hafsa the daughter of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhuma. So Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha asked Sayyida Umm Salama radiallahu anha, what about this new wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Is she cute? She used a very uh, uh, weird term, adharifatun hiya, is she cute? And Sayyida Umm Salama radiallahu anha said, yes, she is. And Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha initially didn't like that. But later on, they became very close friends because they were very close in age, Sayyida Aisha and Sayyida Safiya radiallahu anhuma. But still, in that household of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sometimes some friction would happen and they used to call Sayyida Safiya radiallahu anha, Ya bint al-Yahudi, O daughter of the Jewish man. And that really hurt Sayyida Safiya radiallahu anha because again, why are you talking to me about my father, who I know he was an enemy of the Prophet ﷺ, but this is nothing that I can control. So one day she went complaining to the Prophet ﷺ. He saw her crying, so he asked her, what's going on? And she said that the other wives are sometimes calling me Yabnat al-Yahudi. And it was especially Sayyida Zainab bint Jahsh radiallahu anha. And the Prophet ﷺ told her, well, if they say that one more time, tell them my father is Harun, and my uncle is Musa, talking about her great, great, great grandfather, Sayyidina Harun ala nabina wa alayhi salatu wassalam, and her great, great, great uncle, Sayyidina Musa ala nabina wa alayhi salatu wassalam, who can come from a better lineage, a, a, a prophet as a grandfather, a great grandfather, and another great prophet, Sayyidina Musa ala nabina wa alayhi salatu wassalam, as a great uncle. So from that time on, whenever someone would tell her, the daughter of the Jewish man, she would say, yes, my great-grandfather is Sayyidina Harun and my great-uncle is Sayyidina Musa ala Nabina alayhi salatu wasalam. And they stopped basically teasing her from that time on because they knew it's not going to work. So several happy events happening to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the conquest of Khaybar, the uh, issue with Fadak, Tayma, and Wadi al-Qura, the arrival of the tribes from Daus, from Yemen, al Ashaira, and from al Habasha, the marriage of the Prophet وسلم, that took place on the way back from Khaybar to Al Madina al Munawwara with Sayyida Safiya radiallahu anha. And then when the Prophet وسلم, reached Al Madina al Munawwara, he was united with his new bride as well, Sayyida Umm Habiba bint Abi Sufyan radiallahu anha. We notice here that as we mentioned before, Many of the marriages of the Prophet وسلم, had also a strategic value or a, a, an important value connecting the community of the Prophet وسلم, to other communities. So for example, we find that by marrying the daughters of his two closest friends, Sayyida Aisha and Sayyida Hafsa radiallahu anha, that was honoring their fathers. By marrying Sayyida Juwayriya bint al-Harith radiallahu anha, for example, that was basically honoring her tribe who were defeated Bani al-Mustaliq in the battle of al-Muraysiyah or Bani al-Mustaliq. By marrying a Sayyida Umm Salama radiallahu anha that was honoring her uh, steadfastness and her sacrifice, especially after the passing of her great husband, a Sayyida Abu Salama radiallahu anhu, and so on. And we see here, for example, in the marriage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to both a Sayyida Safiya radiallahu anha and a Sayyida Umm Habiba radiallahu anha, there was a value in these marriages, not only 
the, the marriage between a man and a woman, but also a, the indirect links to their tribes and their uh, people. Now, Abu Sufyan, as soon the uh, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, the leader of Quraysh, as soon as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was signed, he saw that this the, this is an opportunity that I should use because, as we mentioned before, for the previous years before Hudaybiyah, the trade route of Quraysh to Asham was completely unsafe. They tried several times and they lost their trade in many of these expeditions. So now that we have signed a truce, a ceasefire with the Prophet wasallam, it is safe to go back to Asham without trade. So he took a huge caravan and traveled to Asham. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepared things in a very beautiful way. Around that time, there had been a major confrontation between the Persians and the Romans. If you remember again going back to the days of Mecca when the Persians defeated the Romans and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Rum when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was in Mecca when uh, Ubay ibn Khalaf waged a, a gamble against Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Alif Lam Mim Ghulibat Al-Rum Fi Adna Al-Ardi Wa Hum Min Ba'di Ghalabihim Sayyidibuna Fi Bid'i Sineen uh, Quraysh was pleased that the Persians, their idol worshippers, fellow idol worshippers, defeated the Romans who were from the family of the scripture. Uh, the the non-believers were happy and for different reasons. First of all, because again, uh, people who did not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defeated those who claimed to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was one reason. Another reason is that now our trade is going to be more prosperous because again, the Persians controlling uh, part of uh, uh, Asham. Now that's going to allow us to sell our goods at a higher price to the Romans because they can't get it in any other safe way. So it's a, it's a good thing for our business. And Ubay ibn Khalaf told Sayyidina Abu Bakr, was taunting Sayyidina Abu Bakr about that. And Sayyidina Abu Bakr, when the first ayat from Surah Al-Rum were revealed, told him, no, the Romans are going to conquer back in three years. He, saw, he thought that Bid'ah is three. The minimum term of Bid'ah is three and the maximum is nine. So he told Sayyidina Abu Bakr, I, uh, I bet you I'm going to put 10 camels and against 10 camels from your side. In three years, if the Romans do not win, you owe me 10 camels. Sayyidina Abu Bakr anh, told him, fine. And then when he told the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet wasallam, told him, why did you say three? Bid'ah could be, could be up to nine. Increase the period and raise the bet. Make it 100 camels. Sayyidina Abu Bakr went back to Ubay and told him, listen, I want to extend the period to nine years and to make it 100 camels. And Ubay said, that's fine. And actually, after, within nine years, the Romans defeated the Persians and the family of Ubay ibn Khalaf paid these 100 camels as a... a, a sign of honor, they paid them to Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu because they owed him these hundred camels. The emperor of the Romans, to appreciate and to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this victory, made a, uh, a pledge that he's going to make a pilgrimage on foot from Homs in Syria to Ilya, which is uh, Al-Quds, Jerusalem, in Bayt al-Maqdis. He's going to walk on foot between these two cities as a sign of uh, gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he arrived in Homs, he heard about, uh, or when he arrived actually in Ilya, which is Bayt al-Maqdis, he heard, uh, he received a letter from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because immediately after the truce of Hudaybiyah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam started sending messages or letters to the leaders of the world around him, sallallahu alayhi wa He sent a letter to Kisra. He sent a letter to uh, uh, Herakl, who was the emperor of the Romans. He sent a letter to Al-Muqawqis, the leader of Egypt, the ruler of Egypt. He sent a letter to Al-Najashi, not the initial, the original Najashi, but his follower, because the original Najashi, radiallahu anhu, had passed away as a believer, as a companion of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa Now his successor, 
the title and Najashi is a title like Kisra or like Qaisar for the Romans and the Persians. So and Najashi, the new one, again had embraced Islam and followed the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the message was the same. The message is from Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to such and such. Assalamu ala man ittaba'al huda. Peace be upon those who select to follow guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you embrace Islam, you are going to be approved as the leader of your people. We do not want to conquer any land or to invade any land. If you accept, we want to spread Islam. If you accept Islam, you are going to be approved as the leader of your people. And if you reject, you carry the sin of not exposing your people to Islam. And that letter was always concluded with an ayah. قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهَ وَلَا نُشْرِكَ بِهِ شَيْئًا The mere translation of the ayah is, O oh, say, family of the scripture, come to a common word that we have with you, not to worship anything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to associate anything with anyone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not to take each other as deities apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا يَتَّخِذَ بَعْضُنَا بَعْضًا أَرْبَابًا مِن دُونِ الله. If they reject, declare we are Muslims. So this letter came to uh, Heraclius, the emperor of the Romans, when he was on his pilgrimage, on his foot pilgrimage, and he had just arrived in Bayt al-Maqdis. So he asked, are there any people coming from Arabia? He knew about these trade delegations that used to come from Arabia. He asked, is there anyone from Arabia who can tell me about this man? And they told him, there's a group, a trade caravan that came from Arabia in Gaza. Gaza is not too far from uh, Bayt al-Maqdis. So they said, we're going to go and bring some of them to talk to you. So uh, Abu Sufyan, Sayyidina Abu Sufyan, radiallahu anhu, later on, at that time he was still a non-believer. He said, I was with my uh, colleagues, with my group, with my caravan in Gaza. And I saw the Roman soldiers coming and telling me to come with them to meet with Heraclius the emperor of the Romans. So he, couldn't ha he didn't have any option. He went with them and Heraclius asked him, are you from the same tribe as this man? Are you the closest to this man uh, by uh, ancestry? And he told him, yes, I am from the same tribe. So Heraclius wanted to ask a few questions about the Prophet So he told Sayyidina Abu Sufyan, come close to me. And sit with your back to your followers. I'm going to ask you a few questions. And you'd better not lie to me. If you lie to me, and he looked at the group and he said, if he lies to me, tell me that he's lying. Sayyidina Abu Sufyan radiallahu anhu said, well, I didn't want to lie because I did, I did not want to be known as a liar. As a leader of my people and as a sign of respect and prestige, I wouldn't lie to them. So I, did want, I, I could not make any lies now that he, that he threatened that my people are going to expose me. And he started asking questions about the Prophet So he asked, who is this man? And what is his lineage? What is his ancestry? And Abu Sufyan told him, he's from a very prominent family, very well-known family, a good family, a good tribe, a good clan. And then he asked him, did any of his ancestors have a kingdom or was a king? And Abu Sufyan said, no, we did not have any kings in Arabia. So Heraclius asked him, did any of his ancestors claim this prophethood before? And Abu Sufyan said, no, none of his ancestors or fathers or grandfathers claimed anything like that. Then he asked him, then tell me about his followers. Who are his followers? Are they the rich and famous or are they the poor and, and weak and destitute? So Abu Sufyan said, they are usually the poor, the weak, and the destitute, although his followers come from all walks of life, but the majority are the poor ones. So Heraclius asked him, are they increasing in number or decreasing in number? Abu Sufyan said, well, actually they are increasing in number. So he asked him, does any one of them go back and reject Islam or reject that faith after having entered that faith? And Abu Sufyan said, no, it doesn't happen. It's usually the other way around. When they come to that faith, they are very persistent about staying in that faith. 
defending it, and they would sacrifice their lives for it. And then he asked him, what does he command you to do? He said, he commands us to do the good things, to be kind, to be honest, to be chaste, to, to connect the ties of kinship, and he commands us to do good things and to abandon the worship of many idols or deities and worship only one God. So Heraclius asked him, have you had any wars with him? And he said, yes, we've had many wars with him. So Heraclius asked, and what was the result of these wars? Abu Sufyan said, and this is the only way I can, I can put the Muslims down a little bit. So he said, well, it's sometimes they win, sometimes we win. Well, if you were to be honest, the Muslims won in Badr, the Muslims tied in Uhud, the Muslims won in Al-Ahzab, and, and the Prophet Sallallahu was always on the rise. But these were, this is the closest Abu Sufyan could say to put down the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions. And the last question from Heraclius was, then how come you traveled safely here? Abu Sufyan said, now we have a truce with him. We have a ceasefire with him. So Heraclius asked, do you think he's going to betray that uh, truce? So Abu Sufyan, no, we do not think that, that he's gonna, he never broke his promise. He never betrayed us before. Abu Sufyan wondered, what's all these questions? Where, what are they leading to? So finally, Heraclius gave him the justification for these questions. He told him, well, I'll tell you why I asked these questions. I asked, where is he from your community? And you said he comes from a very good family, very stable family, very honorable family. And that's how the prophets usually come. They come from good families in their communities. I asked you if any of his ancestors or grandfathers was a king and you said no well if one of them was a king i would say he would he was trying to reclaim the throne of his ancestors i asked you if any of his forefathers had claimed that prophethood before and you said no and if it had been he would be just imitating his forefathers i asked him you about his followers are they the rich and the famous or the the destitute and the poor and you said the poor and the destitute, the majority of them, and that's the nature of the followers of prophets and messengers. The rich usually have their arrogance that they have something to lose by relinquishing that uh, pr privilege, but the poor do not have anything to lose and they open their hearts and minds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I asked you about his companions. Are they increasing in number or decreasing? And you said they are increasing and that's again the nature of faith when it's merged with the hearts, people would hate to go back into disbelief. I asked you about the wars that you had with him, and you said sometimes you win, sometimes he wins. And again, this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests his true servants. It's not on, only victory, but sometimes they might suffer from some defeat as, as a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I asked you about what is he commanding you to do, and you said only good things. Al Amr bil Ma'ruf, Wal Nahi al Munkar, Wal Salah, Wal Afaf, Wal Sila, Sila al Rahim. All good things, the enjoining good, forbidding evils, prayer, uh, tying the, the tie, linking the ties of kinship, and being chaste and honest. And these are all good things, and this is what usually the prophets uh, command their people or, or their followers to do. So now he justified all of his questions to Abu Sufyan and now he had to add his own conclusion. And he said, this is the man that we find in our books. And I, would, I thought that he was going to come from Bani Israel, from the descendants of Harun and not from uh, the descendants of Ismail And if I was in his presence, I would follow him and I would wash his feet with water. Abu Sufyan is listening. Who is talking? That's the emperor of the Romans, the leader of the superpower, the ascending superpower who had just defeated the other superpower. 
and he's saying that if he saw the Prophet وسلم, he would follow him and he would travel to him and he would wash his feet, that was a complete surprise to Sayyidina Abu Sufyan anhu. And when he left, he told his people that لَقَدْ أَمِرَ أَمْرُ إِبْنِ أَبِي كَبْشَ Abu Kabsha is the husband of Halim al Sa'diya, and usually the Arabs, when they wanted to make fun or uh, disparage the Prophet, وسلم, instead of calling him Ibn Abdullah from the tribe of Quraysh, they would say Ibn Abi Kabsha. And Abu Sufyan said, Laqad Amira Amru ibn Abi Kabsha, Hatta Yakshahu Malikur Rum. The, the uh, reputation and the uh, reign of the son of Abu Kabsha, talking about the Prophet وسلم, has become so supreme that the king, the emperor of the Romans, is mentioning him and talking about him in such a positive way. Later on, Heraclius, who was a very smart man, but he was again an emperor and had a lot to lose, after Abu Sufyan left, he basically gathered all of his patriarchs in a, uh, a meeting room, a large meeting room and he locked all the doors and then he told them if you want to the if you want the success in this life and the, in the hereafter follow me and let's go and join this man and become his followers muslims the patriarchs christians of course rejected that and rebelled against him and tried to get out of the room started knocking on the doors so when he saw that they were persistent in their rejection, he told them, come, come, come close. I'm, I was just kidding. I was just testing you to see your strength in your faith. But we're going to stay, of course, as Christians. We're not going to follow this man. The Prophet وسلم, when he received this news, he said the man preferred his throne over following the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And later on, Heraclius died as a Christian and did not follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So until next time, inshallah, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.